uh, Professor Luck experiences uh, some problems, technical problems with the internet. I'll probably start uh, my presentation. Uh, but first of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Adlakha and JNU and uh, Institute of Chinese Studies for bringing us together uh, in our turbulent times in the midst of pandemic. And uh, I also remember attending a conference on Lusun on the grassroots four years ago uh, in Delhi and uh, it was very good to be able to meet each other. And I'm very grateful uh, to the hosts and Lakha for taking so many care of us because as far as I can remember, the day we arrived to Delhi, the money reform started in India. <laughs> and if JNU uh, and JNU really cared for all our meals and everything because we were without money totally, it was a rather interesting experience to be without totally without money in a foreign country. But uh, due to the support of our Indian friends, it was fine, uh, but unforgettable. So. Uh, today, uh, Professor Adlaka has already picked up the question, is Lucien dead or alive? Is AQ mm. still alive or not? Uh, well, from a physical point of view, of course they are. From moral, not. But we have one more perspective, I would say, commercial point of view. Well, Lucien wouldn't like it, but that um, the name of Lucien name of a queue and uh, um, many other um, protagonists from Lusun stories actually are ac actively commercialized in China now. We can see hotels uh, named after uh, Lusun stories. We can see, see Kunizi Fandian, uh, restaurant Kunizi. We can see a queue uh, seeds and a queue uh, stinky bin curd. Uh, so people are making big monies uh, on the name of Lucien and his stories. So from commercial point of view, Lucien is more than alive. But I think that he wouldn't like that. Well, my presentation today is about why Lucien was translated into Russian, uh, how he was translated and translated. Uh, uh, I'll speak on, and yes, first, please let me put my presentation on the screen. Just a second. Just a second. Uh, here it is. I hope that you can see my presentation on full screen. Yes. Is it fine? It is. Okay, great. So I'll speak on uh, five translations of the true story of AQ into the Russian language today. And uh, first, it must be said that in the 20s, Russia has undergone many turmoils, political shocks, revolutionary revolutions, and uh, uh, it didn't follow closely at that time to the Chinese literary arena. Russians at that time were, were more keen on a revolution and abroad too, not on literature. Uh, and above all leading Russian sinologists of the 20s, they were mainly in the classical studies, not in modern studies. So modern Chinese literature, literary revolution, it was mainly neglected uh, up to the end of the 20s. Uh, so there was a 10 years lag in the studies of what is going on in Chinese literature and in translations too. So the first paper dealing with modern Chinese literature appeared in 1925. And uh, it was a paper by academician Alexeyev devoted to the modern poetry. Uh, and modern poetry was criticized there. And the first uh, collection of translations of modern Chinese prose appeared only in 19, 
29, and Lusun was included there. Uh, and uh, actually, the introduction to that collection and later collections of Lusun and other stories by modern writers gave the first introduction to modern Chinese literature uh, to the Russian audience. But as I said, there was a 10 years lag. Uh, I would like also draw it, uh, your attention to the fact that in the end of 20s, um, Lusun was perception of Lusun in the end of 20s in Russia. And in the end, or in the middle of 30s is different. Uh, needless to say that in 40s and 50s and 60s. First, in the end of 20s, Lusun was regarded as an anarchist and individualistic writer. And it was only by the middle of 30s that uh, <laughs> Russian scholars uh, started to regard him as a patriotic and proletariat and Marxist writer. Uh, well, and there were reasons behind it, of course. And it was true because in the beginning, in the end of 20s, uh, our sinologists, they um, mainly paid attention to the early texts of Lusun, like those who are coming from the battle cry from Nahan, like uh, Kunidzi, like uh, Akyu Zhengzhou and Dundon. So, uh, up to now, up to now, uh, none of the modern Chinese writers has been translated into Russian uh, uh, language uh, so fully and published at such considered circulations as Lusun. You can see that beginning in the 1929 till today, we have 21 collection personal collection, individual collection of Lusun works published in Russian, first in 1929 and the last in 2016. Uh, number two is judging by the circulation. Number two is Laoshe. Uh, but actually the number of separate collections is uh, surpasses Lusun. Number three is Jan Tieni, due his children's literature. And uh, number four is Mao Dun, number five is Badzin, and number six is Gomajo. Uh, well, here I listed only representatives of uh, modern literature, uh, right of May force writers, uh, as we call them. I didn't include here uh, contemporary writers like Moyan or Lutsisin, but they are far from, from uh, these uh, numbers. So it's really hard to surpass the results of Lucian's translations into the Russian language. So uh, by now there exist Russian translations of at least uh, 407 literary works of Lucian. Among these 175 are his letters. Um, Lusun's works were published in 21 separate collections with a total circulation, as you said, it's, which is more than 1 million and 400,000 copies. And among them, the first edition appeared in 1929, the last in 2016. I would like also to draw your attention to the fact that 29 works of Lusun have more than one Russian. Uh, and 42 of Lusun's stories were published five times and more. Well, here on the screen now, you can see uh, that uh, two works of Lusun, the true story of Aq and the New Year's sacrifice, Jufu, Aq Jandran, they have five translations. Some stories have four translations, some have three and some have two. Well, I'll later discuss why so many. Uh, so this table shows you which top 15 of the most published Lucian works in Russian. And here too, we see that the true story of Aq is a champion. It was published, well, at least 22 times. Uh, uh, and close to it is a Gusian, the homeland 
also and also Kune Ziso, the early stories of uh, Lucien. Uh, I would say that uh, there were five periods of translation, of the climax of translation activity. One was in the very end of the 20s. Uh, after that, after Lucien's death in 19, uh, in the end of 30s. After that, after the World War II, uh, in 50s, during uh, uh, big Chinese Soviet friendship, and later at the very beginning of 70s. So the last new translation of Lusun in the, to the Russian language appeared in 1971. And uh, there were later re-editions but no new translations for the last already 50 years. Um, we can see that translation and uh, publication Focus. has been always put on such realistic stories as the true story of Aku, the homeland, the New Year's sacrifice, uh, Kunedzi, small incident tomorrow at a restaurant, a village show. So all of them coming from the battle cries and wandering collections. Uh, well, and uh, now let's go to the translation of the true story of Aq. Um, as you see here, uh, we have five translations and uh, also plus one translation attempt. So the, it probably existed, but was never published. Uh, so let's go chronologically. Uh, the first publication of Lusun into the Russian language happened in 1929, uh, when uh, the true story of a Q was included into a collection, uh, into this collection, Truthful Biography, Novels and Stories of Contemporary China. So this collection included, uh, apart from Lusun, uh, several Lusun stories, it also included stories by Yu Dafu, by Zhang Zepin, Zhang Wentian, and some other writers. Um, it was translated by Mikhail Kokin. So who was Mikhail Kokin and how has he come to translate Lusun? in 1929. It's rather interesting story, interesting story. Uh, well, Mikhail Kokin was, a, you say, a young revolutionary. He was uh, uh, a member of the Communist Party. Uh, he was born in 1906. Well, actually, at that time, Poland was a part of the Russian Empire. And uh, in 20s, he studied Chinese language at the Moscow Institute of Oriental Studies. And also he was a student at the uh, Communist University of the Workers of the East. It's a rather interesting institution in Moscow, which was mainly established in order to prepare revolutionaries from all over the world. But there were also Russian students. And uh, Kokin um, was not only a student there, he was also a curator of a, a group of Chinese students. So, and it's probably from his Chinese friends, young Chinese people, young Chinese revolutionary, that he learned something about Lusun. We also know that he was aware of the translations of Lucien into English language, and he was also aware of the high estimation given by Romain Roland to the works of uh, Lucien and to the true story of Aq. Uh, it's also interesting to note that one of the professors of this communist university of the workers of the East was Vasily Yeroshenko. Uh, well, a friend of Lucien already mentioned today by Sebastian. Uh, but to tell the truth, I know nothing about if there was any connection between Kokin and Yeroshenko. 
they must have met at the university at that time. It was not such a big institution. So everybody who were somehow involved in the uh, Chinese and Japanese studies should have known each other. Uh, but nevertheless, we don't know for sure uh, where did he and how did he pick up the story of uh, uh, Akuto Translate. We know, however, that uh, uh, the editor of this book was Sevalot Kolokolov, a uh, rather famous Russian sonologist. He was older than Kokin, and it's uh, well possible that the story was introduced to Kokin by Kolokolov. Well, we must admit that the translation made by Kokin is not that good. I think that he had not such a good command of Chinese language at that time. Um, but still, that's the first published translation. And uh, we also have a reason, uh, judging from uh, Kokin's biography, uh, we can also assume that the story was actually translated two years before the publication in 19, not later than 1927, because later in uh, 1928, uh, Kokin has left Moscow and moved to Leningrad. So translation must have been done before that. But it was, anyhow, it was published in 1929. So as soon as it was published, of course, it was a rather important event for everybody who was engaged into Chinese studies <laughs> and who was interested in China somehow. And uh, there appeared a review written, written by one of the leading Russian sinologists of the time professor of the Leningrad University, Boris Vasiliev. So this review of this translation and the translation of the whole collection was very negative, very negative. And um, as Vasiliev says, in this translation of the true story of Q made by Kokin, he has found 98 omissions, 119 insertions, and more than 150 mistakes. Well, I would say that this five, almost 500, 500 uh, problems is a little bit too much for not, not such a big novel as uh, the true story of a Q is. Uh, well, um, um, and uh, one, the first chapter of the uh, true story was also cut by the translator. And he explained actually that he says that it was too sophisticated, it was too complicated for the Russian reader to understand the differences about different types of biographies. And well, all you know, know the first chapter, the introductionary chapter of the true story of a Q. So there were really numerous, uh, numerous mistakes. But from stylistic point of view, it was more or less fine. It was quite readable. I would say it was a little bit vulgar and there were too many colloquial, colloquial expressions in it, but basically it was fine uh, if you do not know that there were so many mistakes. But in the same year, also in 1929, there appeared one more uh, book. Uh, uh, it was a truthful story of Ake, well, also Ake Jan uh, This collection uh, was prepared by Boris Vasiliev, whom I have mentioned. He was uh, the, the, the very scholar who criticized Kokin's translation. Uh, actually, uh, the translation made by Vasiliev, um, it preceded the Kokin's translation, and it was made in 1925. But it was published later, uh, probably half a year later, but in the same 1929. So uh, Boris Vasiliev was a professor of Leningrad University. He was specialist in 
classical prose, uh, for example, he was a specialist in Shui Hu Zhuan, in the Water Margins, uh, classical novel by Xin Ai. Uh, and uh, for him, modern literature was not his main field. But in the middle of 20s, was sent uh, to China by a Russian foreign ministry. And he, from 1924 uh, till 1927, he served as a translator. Uh, in a Russian consulate, and he was also translator to Russian military specialists who trained Chinese army. So in 1925, when he was in Kaifen, he met a uh, young Russian, a young Chinese man whose name was Cao Xinhua. And Cao Xinhua was uh, also specialist in Russian language. He was also a translator. But Cao Xinhua, uh, uh, later on, he was a professor of Beijing University. And by that time, he was also has a close links with Lu Xun. And he was really uh, one of those young people who uh, were making translations of Russian literature under the guidance of Lu Xun. So when Vasiliev uh, been interested in literature, asked Cao Xinhua about modern Chinese literature, it was Cao Xinhua who introduced the works of Lu Xun to Vasiliev. And uh, Cao Xinhua gave uh, a collection of Lu Xun stories to Vasiliev. Uh, Lu Xun read it and was fascinated. He wrote to Cao Xinhua that Lu Xun is a writer of world level. It's the same, it's, he's as great as Maxim Gorky, Anton Chekhov, and Nikolai Gogol. Well, he used Russian uh, writers, uh, as an example. Uh, with the help of Cao Xinhua, uh, Vasiliev has established direct correspondence with Lu Xun in 1925. So, uh, and uh, I assume that Cao Xinhua has made some introduction because Lu Xun uh, responded to Vasiliev, and they had exchange of several letters. So Vasiliev asked Lucien's permission to translate uh, the true story of a Q and other stories. He also asked him to send a photograph and an introduction for the Russian edition. And Lucien did that all. From Vasiliev's letter to Lucien later in 1925, we know that he made the translation that very year, and he sent uh, the translation, the photo, and the Lucien's introduction to an unnamed uh, publishing house in Moscow. But unfortunately, somehow it wasn't published up to the 1929. And who knows how long will it uh, be at the publishing house if not the book? Uh, with the translation of Kokin, which of course irritated uh, Vasiliev. Um, uh, and we must admit that Vasiliev's translation is much better than that of Kokin. So <clears throat> uh, I would say that uh, Vasiliev's translation was is very accurate. Uh, and he knew Chinese language very well. It's uh, that's for sure. Uh, it's readable. Uh, well, judging from probably contemporary point of view, it could be judged as a, a little bit stylistically outdated, but I think it was absolutely fine in the 1930s. So we have two translations of Lucien published in 1929. Uh, we know also about one more translation, which was uh, probably done in 1927 in China by Sergei Polivoy. Well, Sergei Polivoy was a Russian emigrant who worked in China. He taught at Nanjing University and at Beijing University. Uh, he was not 
acquainted to Lusun personally, but he addressed him in 1927 uh, by letter sent to Guangzhou, where Lusun was at that time, and he asked Lusun's permission to make translation. Lusun answered to him that actually there is already a translation of the true story made by uh, Vasiliev, but uh, if it's fine in your country, then he uh, doesn't mind to have one more translation. Uh, uh, well, Polivoy also asked him uh, to send a photo and uh, to recommend some other stories, but Lucien, I, I think, I, I, I don't know why, but he was not, my impression is that he was, that he was not really friendly uh, to so polite, he was polite but not so friendly to Polivoy as he was to Vasiliev. And he said, Well, just select the stories you want by yourself, uh, and uh, I cannot send you my recent photo because I don't like my recent photos, so just get without them. Uh, and we do not know anything else uh, about the translation of Polivoy. Uh, judging from the correspondence, it seems that there was some progress in translation, but we don't know the result. Uh, it uh, was not published in Russia, for sure, and Polivoy was an immigrant. Uh, and in my knowledge, it wasn't published in China too. So it was a rather common practice to have translations into the foreign language published some way in Shanghai or in Harbin or elsewhere. But uh, probably this was only an attempt which was never fulfilled. Uh, in 1938, we have one more translation of the true story of a Q made in Russia. After the death of Lusun in the end of 1936, uh, and by that time, Lusun's position as a leading uh, proletariat writer was already established not only in China, but also uh, accepted as such in the Soviet Union too. So uh, uh, Russian sinologists start to, uh, to pay more and more attention to Lusun. Thus, after his death, uh, uh, Russian scholars uh, decided to uh, compile a book of collections of Lusun translations and also to uh, include there some articles, some papers devoted to Lusun. Uh, but there happened to be a problem. The problem was that the authors of the earlier trans earliest translations, both Mikhail Kokin and Boris Vasiliev, were repressed. Kokin was arrested in the January of 1937, and uh, he was uh, uh, arrested, jailed, and uh, uh, the court, uh, he's a foreign spy, uh, and he was shot in the May of 1937. Vasiliev was arrested in uh, September of the 1937, and uh, the court judged that he is a counter-revolutionary, and he was also shot. Um, so uh, the problem arises that uh, they were ready translations to be included into this uh, book but the authors were enemies of the country. And uh, it was out of question uh, to use their translations. It was totally impossible up to the time when they were rehabilitated. But the rehabilitation happened 20 years later in the middle of the Thus, all translations made of the true story of a Q and other works of Lusun, which were made in the end of 20s and in the 30s, actually they could not be used in the Soviet Union in the end of 30s, in the 40s, and in the 50s. Well, but 
what to do. The uh, scholars who organized these collections, they didn't have much time to make new translations. They were sure that uh, they will use what is available and it will be fine. Uh, thus, uh, they uh, used such uh, um, original, I would say, approach. They just deleted the names of the original translators. They took the text by made by Boris Vasiliev, translation of Boris Vasiliev, and said that this is um, a new translation made collectively by Leonid Rudov, uh, Amy Xiao, Xiao San, Chinese poet, and Alexander Sprinsin. Well, Leonid Rudov and Alexander Sprinsin were colleagues of Boris Vasiliev at Leningrad University and Institute of Oriental Studies in Leningrad at that time. So they had no attention to plagiarize, uh, but it was a trick how to deal with the censorship. So they said that's a collective translation and that they attended. But if we compare, and when we compare translation uh, made by Vasiliev and their translation, we see that, well, it's a revised version, we say so, revised version of Vasiliev's translation. Uh, so translation of 1938 uh, is not an independent, it's just a version of Vasiliev's translation. Uh, and it was published in 1939. Here, I'll show you how it looked like. Uh, just uh, so here are Leonid Rudov, Amy Xiao, Xiao San, and Alexander Sprinsen, uh, who were behind this translation. And here you can also see uh, here on the list this book, Lucien uh, Dinian Lucien de Barshu, to uh, collection to commemorate Lucien. Uh, the next, the fourth translation appeared in uh, 1945, just after the end of the uh, Second World War. And uh, this translation uh, was made by Vladimir Rogov. It's also a rather interesting sinologist, uh, and I'll show you some details of his biography because it's really interesting to know why people and how they translated the story. And as you can see in my table, actually translation made by Rogov is the most popular in Russia because it was republished 18 times. And even in the very latest uh, edition uh, in 2016, uh, the compilers also used Rogov's version of the true story of AQ. Uh, so, uh, Vladimir Rogov, his, his photo is, just a second. Yes, on the left, on the left, Vladimir Rogov. Uh, Vladimir Rogov studied uh, Chinese language at the Communist University of the Workers of the East in Moscow in the end of 90s. And I think that he was acquainted with Kokin, with Kolokolov, and he must have been acquainted with Vasily Yeroshenko too. Uh, actually, he wrote uh, several articles uh, about Vasily Yeroshenko at later times. But in the 30s, uh, Vladimir Rogov was a journalist and a translator. First, in the beginning of the 30s, he was sent to China to work in Harbin at the uh, China Eastern Railway Station, uh, 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 Railway. Uh, <coughs> and later, in the end of the 30s and in 40s, he was correspondent of the Telegraph Agency of the Soviet Union, TASS, in China. Uh, and he uh, traveled a lot in China and he knew many Chinese writers. Well, he was not equated with Lu Xun, 
but he was familiar with Gomajo, with Laoshe, with Jantini, Mao Dun, and many, many other writers. He was also, he also uh, established a uh, Epoch Publishing House in Shanghai. So this uh, Epoch Publishing House, it promoted Soviet and Russian literatures in the forties. Uh, so, and in 1945, it was the main Soviet literary publishing house, which was a state, li state literature publishing house, which decided to publish a collection of Lusun. Well, there were many Russian sinologists involved in that, but the true story of a Q was translated by Vladimir Rogov. Uh, we do not know exactly which year he made the translation, but it was published in 1945 uh, and uh, republished many times after that. Uh, it is a very good translation, both in terms of accuracy and style. Uh, uh, that is why um, when in 50s, uh, there was already no ban to use translation of Vasiliev. Uh, nobody has used it again because Rogov uh, translation was, well, it's, I, I think it's, it's better. It's stylistically better in, in, and it's still alive up to now. Uh, interesting to note that in 1955, there happened to be one more translation of the true story of Q here, 1955. It was made by Lyubov Pazneyeva. It was published only one time. Uh, I'll show you the photo of Professor Pazneyeva. She's a rather famous Russian sinologist. She was the head of uh, sinology at Moscow University in 60s and 70s. Um, well, um, in 1955, Pazneva was one of the compilers of a companion to modern world literature, which included, uh, well, the works of uh, various writers from all over the world. And so je, there should be one story, could be one story, one novel uh, by a Chinese writer. And she selected it to be Lucien and uh, Lucien's The True Story of Aq. Uh, but uh, there was a limited space and uh, The True Story of Aq was a little bit too long. Uh, that is why she cut three chapters. Uh, three chapters. Um, but it's interesting that this shortened version uh, is also not an independent translation. Because if we can pay it with other versions, we can see many similarities with the version made by Rogov in 1945. Uh, to tell the truth, I cannot understand completely the reason why uh, Rogov is not named also of this translation. And instead of that, we have Pazneva. Probable explanation could be that he did not agree to publish a shortened version. And uh, thus Pazneva, who was one of the editors, he was, uh, uh, well, she took this crime to her name. And uh, uh, yes, she made some corrections, some revisions, but basically, uh, this is also one of the versions of Rogov's translation. Um, now, uh, here on the screen, you can see also some uh, other editions, for example, 1964, but uh, 1986, 89. Uh, these are collections of Lusun's of uh, Lucian stories, which also include the truth of a Q there. And here is the very last, the latest edition of Lucian in Russia, 
It's Lucien, the true story of a Q and other stories. Uh, I was the editor and compiler of this book. And uh, it was published uh, just four years ago in 2016. And uh, I can share with you how uh, I, being an editor, how I decided what to include and what not. The first question was, should we translate some stories again, or we can use the versions which already exist? And uh, and it has two parts. The, uh, first of all, are the all translations good enough? And as I showed you, uh, two works of Lucien have five translations, some have four translations, half some three translations. So, and the answer was yes, there are good translations which can be used uh, with a very, very slight revision and adding some updating commentaries. Uh, and thus, uh, we decided not to translate. To tell the truth, there were also some financial difficulties with this book. So it was uh, also a cheaper decision to use what already existed. Another problem was uh, copyright, because some translations, uh, some translators has already died and we couldn't find the, uh, you know, where the rights, in whose hands the rights now are. It also influences our selection, but finally, I tried to have a balance, balanced con content of this volume. So I included, uh, so that's the book. Uh, I included uh, uh, six stories from the Battle Prize, uh, six stories from the Wanderings, uh, eight pieces from Yetzhau from the Wild Grass, and. Uh, three stories from the old legions in uh, new edition. Uh, so that's how it happened. And uh, four years has passed and we do not know when a new edition of Lucien will be published. But the question is, uh, do we expect new translations to happen? Uh, probably yes, uh, because uh, language, literary language is developing. And I think that uh, the translations uh, made by Rogov and uh, by other scholars will someday become outdated, but not so shortly, not in one year, not in three, maybe 10 or 20 years. And uh, uh, is there a potential for Lusun as a writer in Russia now? Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure that the potential is big. Of course, Lucien uh, stories uh, are read by sinologists and uh, it's a part of our sinological education. Uh, but Lucien's name is not so uh, well known to the wide audience, I would say now. And uh, it's not so easy for contemporary Russians to understand what is he writing about. Uh, mm, probably the stories from the beginning of 20s are a little bit easier, but his later stories uh, require you to know political context, historical context, which is uh, what Russian white audience does not possess. Uh, still, for those who are in Chinese studies, Lustun definitely is alive. And uh, his stories are a must for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alexei, uh, for that wonderful uh, detailed uh, exposition to the uh, chronological as well as the historical uh, uh, aspect of not one, two, three, but five translations of RQ. And uh, as you said, that uh, you will not be surprised if there is a sixth translation, not maybe immediately, but after some time. Thank you very much. And now we come to the uh, final uh, and the concluding paper, uh, which is by me. Um, 
Uh, the title of my paper is uh, 1911 Revolution and Lushun's uh, Trilogy of a Madman's Diary, Khungi Chi, and the True Story of Akyu. Let me begin by reading out the abstract of my paper, uh, and then I will uh, discuss the paper. The abstract is as follows. Uh, for a long time, scholars in China maintained that Lushun's The True Story of Akyu is a sad commentary on the failure of the 1911 revolution. However, in recent years, some Chinese scholars have not only questioned such claims, but they've also been advocating for a proper understanding and objective re-evaluation of both 1911 revolution and of Lu Xun's thoughts. For the reason, Lu Xun not only affirmed the goals of the revolution pursued, but he was also a participant in the revolution. Lushun never refuted the revolution. This paper examines the ensuing debate in China on how the understanding of the 1911 revolution is incomplete without a thorough analysis of the profound impact of the revolution on Lushun's three master, three most representative creative works, which may be called a trilogy. Furthermore, some younger scholars are now even claiming it is crucial in evaluating both China's modern history as well as in determining China's future trajectory. So now let me turn to my paper. Uh, scholars claim the true story of RQ is the most elaborate fictional work by Lu Xun, who in turn has been regarded as modern China's most celebrated thinker, writer, essayist and pioneer of vernacular fiction. According to uh, a contemporary uh, cultural critique, uh, Chang Xiutong, no other works in modern Chinese literary history even come close to Akyu's literary and political intensity and popularity, which seem to have crystallized into a monad, a pure thought image capable of confronting history. That is both in the ahistorical sense as tradition, culture, and morality, and in the historical sense as a process, scheme, and the new as a text. Uh, by means of its allegorical complexity and simplicity in one. Chang Xu Tung further adds, and I quote, it is unthinkable for anyone to deny that of all the major works of the new literature, produced since May 4th movement in 1919, Akyu alone has reached, within the Chinese context, the height of monumentality, autonomy, originality, as well as the kind of all-encompassing, all-explanatory status pursued and dreamed about by high modernism. Julia Lovell, who translated Lu Xun's fictional works, including the true story of Akyu, which was published by Peng Classy in 2000 under the title, The Real Story of Akyu and Other Tales of China. <clears throat> she, she, um, she believes that communist China's curious posthumous cult of Lu Xun tells us a good deal about how Mao and his successors have tried to cope with the writer's argumentative brand of intellectual independence. Commenting on the then unfolding controversy caused due to the unceremonious delisting of Lushun's works, especially the true story of Akyu from the school and college language, language and culture syllabi in the opening decade of this millennia, Julia Lowell had observed, and I quote, but even decades after Mao started removing the sting from Lushun, official discomfort with this dependency. In 2007, the beginnings of a Lushun withdrawal from Chinese school textbooks began, partly to make way for escapist Kung Fu texts, perhaps the first to really die young, or perhaps to redirect their impressionable minds from Lushun's moody introspection towards a more exuberant self-confidence, unquote. In addition to this, let us recall here that there had been voices in China demanding complete ban on Lushun's fiction 
in the face of 1989 Tiananmen Square democracy movement for the reason that Lushun had become the tallest symbol of dissidence for the student protesters. It is no surprise the modern China's most influential and popular literary icon has not been officially decorated or remembered since the advent of the reformist CPC successive regimes. Of course, one go on for hours talking about Lushun and his art story. For as one any theory critique once said, AQ is not a story about China, AQ is China. Let us leave the issue of Lushun and AQ aside and return to the topic of the paper, that is the relationship or connection between the failure of 1911 revolution and the birth of the character AQ and the narrative of AQ biography. The year 2011 was the centenary of the 1911 revolution or Xinhai Keming in Chinese. The year also saw two other important anniversary celebrations in China, the 130th birth anniversary of Lushun and 90th anniversary of the publication of the true story of Aki. Anniversaries of three major historical events being observed within the same year was anyway bound to attract interest from experts and people in general. To explore possible interrelationship, direct or indirectly, between among these events. Yet, fact is, the respective event being celebrated in the same year, scholars in China for long have been making attempts to evaluate the impact, the influence, and the implications of the 1911 revolution on Lushun's thinking and on Lushun's creative works. Besides, there has been a contentious debate whether Lushun had felt dejected and therefore rejected the revolution of 1911 as anything but an inspiration to look forward to a better and modern China and hope for the new man, Li Ren. It is in this backdrop this paper seeks to examine a long debated notion among cultural critiques and scholarly circles in China that Lu Xun wrote the true story of Akiu as the sad commentary on the failure of 1911 revolution. A commentary published in the literary section of the People's Daily in February 2012 observed, and I quote, to link the creation of the Akiu story with the complete failure and dashing of hopes with 1911 revolution requires a thorough understanding and objective evaluation of both the revolution and Lushun's thoughts. It also concerns the current historical positioning and the future tra trajectory of China." Unquote. Apparently, the controversial debate on the connection between the failure of 1911 revolution and Lushun's creation of the fictional narrative of Akiu seems to have been settled down among China's cultural and literary critiques. Before I open the discussion, let me cite a quotation here from a speech which is not much known outside China by Mao in 1938, when he was invited to inaugurate the newly established Lushun Literary Academy in Beijing. Mao began his speech by raising the question, how should we look at art? And then Mao replies, and I quote, this controversial issue has been intensely debated among China's intellectuals. Poet Xu Mo once said, a poem should ring like a silver needle in a valley. How does the silver needle ring in a valley? I don't know, Mao said. What I do know, is Xu Mo is an art supremacist. That means he is an advocate of art for art's sake. There are many poets and writers who hold the similar opinion. Xu Mo represents their voice. On the other hand, there is this Marxist artistic theory of which Lu Xun is the leading voice. These artists have long been advocating the Marxist view of art and literature. Today, I do not have time to indulge in this discussion, that is Mao. But I must say, superior art is artistic idealism and is a wrong concept. In next, we need all artists 
and writers to form a front in order to resist and fight Japan. As Lushun said, it does not matter if you are a realist or a romanticist, a communist or whatever ism you belong to. Everyone should come together to fight the Japanese. Of course, for us, it is very important to maintain our political independence in art. We must never give up our politics in art. The Lushun Art Academy must hold on to its politics, unquote. That was a long quote from Mao to put the discussion in the context. I shall return to Mao's quote and its relevance to the present discussion in the later part of my paper. In a joint paper published two years ago, entitled Tui Akyu Changchuan Fouting Xinhai Kerming the Fanpo, that is refuting the claim that the true story of Akyu is the negation of 1911 revolution, authors Chen Youchun and Liu Xiaoling have argued that the controversy surrounding the true story of Akyu seems to have been resolved. According to these two authors, Lu Xun's so-called criticism of the 1911 revolution in the Akyu story stems from the perspective of ideological enlightenment and reforming citizens. Furthermore, in the story or from the viewpoint of the protagonist, the revolution is understood as revolutions in general and not within the specific historical context of the 1911 revolution, which put an end to the 200 years of the Manchu rule. Moreover, on the one hand, the revolution has been portrayed as the ideal manifestation of multiple national facets, while on the other hand, the revolution is also described as the mourning of the weaknesses in the national character. In other words, unquote, in other words, the 1911 revolution is viewed both as success and failure at the same time. It is pertinent to mention here that as early as in 1954, at a time when the new China had just been established and the prevailing mood in the country was that of high wave of revolutionary spirit and militancy, a Chinese scholar named Chen Tung in an article on realism in Lushun's fiction, published in the literary journal People's Literature, wrote, and I quote, the true story of Akyu reveals the weaknesses and shortcomings of the 1911 revolution from the point of view of oppressed peasants and democratic revolution respectively. And that on the whole, the revolution not only completely flopped, but that it also failed in accomplishing its basic tasks and goals. Unquote. Chan Thung, the author of that article, further added, and I quote, one of the basic causes for its failure lay in the fact that there was very little or no peasant participation in the revolution. Unquote. Chan Thung makes interesting reading juxtaposed against Mao's hesitation of 1911 revolution. Mao regarded not only a witness like Lushun himself to the 1911 revolution, but Mao's critical evaluation of the revolution is considered among China scholars as one of the politically most profound and historically progressive. According to Mao, and I quote, the revolution overthrew the rule of Qing dynasty, ending the autocratic monarchy of 2000 years in China and brought about the emancipation of thought and democratic consciousness. Furthermore, while applauding the leadership role and revolutionary spirit of Dr. Sun Yat-sen in bringing about the revolution, Mao at the same time also pointed out the reasons for the failure of the revolution. Mao attributed the main factor in the revolution's failure as that of the absence of the radical anti imperialist and anti-feudal revolutionary program. Perhaps inspired by Mao's positive and and also influenced by the contrary regime's perspective on the revolutionary content of the 1911. Uh, decades later, a Chinese scholar joined issues with 1954's article. Professor Yan Chia Yan, in a recent book, 
the title of the book was lun rushun the foot ya so that is on rushun's polyphonic fiction it was published by the peking university press in 2011 professor yanche yen claimed it and i quote claims such as the true story of ayu is an ideological critique and rejection of the bourgeois 1911 revolutions are untenable and intangible unquote thus while overturning the thesis that lushun denied the 1911 revolution and at the same time acknowledging that the true story of aqu was all about the revolution's failure what is it that yanchia yan is trying to establish this is the core issue that the scholars in china have been debating for almost 100 years according to the people's daily uh, in in 2012 the fundamental issue raised by chantung in 1954 was that the 19 revolution 1911 revolution was a total failure as it did not accomplish any of the basic tasks of the chinese revolution and not only remains those tasks not only remains unresolved till today but its several ambiguities may be attributed to the changing political headwinds during the past <clears throat> seven decades of new china since 1949 not only during the pre 49 period filled with political uncertainty a civil war and the anti japanese era but even for decades following the establishment of new china thanks largely to the successive political movements such as greatly forward in 1950s and and the great proletarian cultural revolution during the 60s and 70s objective understanding and historically correct evaluation of 1911 revolution had eluded china's historians and cultural critics alike despite the advent of the so called reform era following the cpc 11 central committee's third plenum in 1979 the tendency to use history or historicizing the past as an instrument to serve the current political needs ensured an objective assessment of not only 1911 revolution but even fictional accounts of social forces behind the revolution continue to remain elusive in the country's political discourse as a result more and newer questions keep appearing and accumulating while the answers are hard to provide questions such as why is the 1911 revolution is called both a success and a failure at the same time why the revolution is hailed as the culmination of the progressive and democratic bourgeois forces and at the same time criticized for its weaknesses which allowed rulers like yuan shikai to steal away the fruits of the successful revolution if the revolution was a failure and if it did not bear fruit why then talk about its fruits being stolen away shouldn't the 1911 revolution be given its due credit for making sure that in spite of the desolation of changshuin if a warlord at that time that <clears throat> in spite of the deterioration so called peiyang warlord rule the prevailing fluid political situation completely ruled out any possibility of the return to rule by a single nationwide feudal warlord or imperial ruler several scholars have raised the question of attributing failure of the revolution to the non participation or non mobilization of peasant masses a related question that comes to mind is that even if non participation of masses is considered as an important factor resulting in the failure of the re re revolution isn't it also true that a bourgeois revolution is bound to be lacking in the large scale participation by the common people speaking of bourgeois revolutions another chinese scholar han sung yi in his very telling essay the true story of aqu and 1911 revolution has adequately addressed the question of what is called a bourgeois revolution and the non participation of common masses cannot be the only factor for the failure of such a revolution let us now briefly look at 1911 revolution from the point of view of the two scene professor wang hui of the tsinghua university and one of the foremost authorities on lushun and lushun works in his most recent work lushun's aqu called six moments in aqu's life aqu shang aqu shang ming chung the liu ke shen jian published in january 2014 by east china normal university press in this book wang hui argues 
that the true story of RQ in China has been caught between two extreme interpretations. That is, between the shortcomings of the revolution on one hand and critiquing the inadequacies of the revolutionary forces and people leading the revolution, both apologies for the revolution as well as literary critiques fail to arrive at a common ground in their respective analysis of the revolution and also on Aq's critique of the revolution. According to Wang Hui, the revolution's allegory must be understood as allegory about the transformation of China's national character. In other words, Wang Hui claims, viewed from Aq's eyes, Lu Xun sees two revolutions in the 1911 revolution, and I quote, one is the revolution that marks the beginning of a new history. The other is the social change that takes place in the name of the revolution, unquote. Finally, to conclude, it is not incorrect to say, given Lu Xun's personal involvement in the revolutionary activities, both in Shaoxing on the eve of 1911 revolution, and a little later, when he moved to Nanjing in the late 1911 and accepted the invitation by Tsai Wanpei to join the Education Bureau in the new democratic government, Lu Xun had great expectations and hope in the revolution. However, as the revolution soon started to wither away in front of Lu Xun's own eyes and before long was abandoned halfway by its very interlocutors, the fundamental issues of the revolution basically not only remain unresolved, in fact, they became even more acute and intense as the feudal warlord forces took control of the Democratic Republic. The Diary of a Madman, written on the eve of 1919 May 4th movement, was Lucian's first short story and was written with a clear purpose of exposing and critiquing the decadent feudal society and family ethics. Frustrated by the stealing away of the fruits of the revolution by the feudal elements within the democratic revolutionary movement, Lucian's madman was a traitor, traitor to his own class. No wonder the short story is hailed as the first anti-feudal morality, anti-feudal ethics literary work in modern Chinese literature. Feeling cheated and therefore angered by the rise of feudal and warlord forces into the early days of the revolution, Lucian's diary of a madman is also seen as his complete resistance to the feudal system and its political superstructure. Blaming the feudal tendencies within the revolutionary movement, who became the chief cause which led to the abandoning of the revolution, the madman, Kung Yi Chi, and Akyu, all three represent the most decadent, immoral, unethical, and anti-people symptoms of feudal China. The madman was born in the family of feudal scholar officials, and was the victim of the feudal morality. He became convinced that he was living in a cannibal society and started fearing he himself will be eaten away. Kung Chi, a kind-hearted soul who had been bugged by the poison of the imperial examination system and had become a good-for-nothing fellow, since he failed the examination, the impoverished and pretentious Kung Chi is treated by the feudal society as a reject material. He finally dies in misery. Then there was Akyu. On closer scrutiny, it is not difficult to trace a common characteristic between all the three. However, of the three short stories, it is a true story of Akyu that eventually became the most repetitive of Lucian's work. And the other two protagonists, Akyu is in both before and after the revolution. Again, Unlike the madman and Kung Yi Chi, Akyu has nothing, and nothing in terms of his possessions and survives by doing all sorts of trivial jobs. A recent article in the Japan Times has observed in his short stories, A Madman's Diary, Kung Yi Chi and the True Story of Akyu, Lushun, penned, Lushun wrote his devastating critique of the Xinhai Revolution of 1911 and China's ongoing social malaise. Although he actually is able to perform petty jobs, Akyu st still thanks to the social, societal oppression and exploitation, Akyu is perpetually living in crisis and is unsure of survival. He is bullied all the time by everyone. The news of the 1911 revolution excites and stimulates him towards a new life. He yearns for revolution. However, 
the pseudo foreign devils do not let him join the revolution and deny him the fruits of the revolution. In all three short stories, the protagonist ultimately fails to surpass the societal, feudal, and systemic restrictions imposed on him. The trilogy ends on a disastrous conclusion. That is, the fake or pseudo foreign devil would not allow a genuine revolution to take place. Call it a comedy or tragedy. Even Lucian himself had to face accusations of being called a pseudo foreign devil. Let me end with the, with the French Nobel laureate Roman Roland, what he wrote about Akiu. In 1925, a Chinese student studying in Paris had translated Akiu into French and he sent it to Roland for Roland's recommendations for publications in the French, in, into French. Upon reading the translation, Roland could not resist the temptation to see the translation published immediately. He forwarded the translation to an editor friend accompanied with the following note, and I quote, at first glance, this story is an unremarkable work of reason. However, you discover the sharp hue contained in it. After reading it, you surprisingly feel that this comic and tragic fellow won't leave you. You can't bear to part with him. Thank you. That is the end of my presentation. We can now invite questions from uh, for both Alexi and uh, for my paper. Um, <clears throat> Well, if, if, if there are no uh, immediately uh, questions, uh, I would like to ask a question to Alexei uh, that, uh, I mean, it's wonderful and amazing also that you have five translations of RQ in Russian. Uh, my question to you is that, in fact, there have been many instances when, when uh, filmmakers and theater uh, producers approached Lushun for the film or the theater adaptation of art within China. And also some uh, scholars, when they approached Lushun for the translation of Lushun's uh, true story of Akiu into a foreign language, Lushun was not very comfortable. And one of the main reasons was that Lushun was afraid that the satire and the irony in the story would be completely lost not only lost, but it might become a comedy. Lushun said when he wrote the story, he never thought that the character or any part of the story can be called a comedy. So that was his fear. So in the five translations into Russian, do you think that the, the, the element of irony and satire has been retained as in the original stories? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, no, I don't think the translators intentionally suppress satire or irony. I think that this, they kept this element, element and they perceived it clearly. So in this regard, the understanding was more or less the same as Lucien's. Um, and uh, as for the uh, cinema and stage, uh, uh, well, yes, there were so many translations and editions of Lucien in Soviet Union and in Russia, but it was never any film was uh, made according to his story. But there were several cases when some stories of a Q were put on stage, and one of them is a true story of a Q. Actually, we have a rather recent case, uh, two or three years ago, one of uh, uh, not so big theaters uh, in St. Petersburg uh, put it on stage. Yeah, so. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask Hemant. Yes. Uh, first of all, it was very, very illuminating paper. I enjoyed it. Uh, but rather it is a curiosity to know, means, you know, if you go through the text of IQ, uh, what it says to a reader, a common reader, about the, the pro process of what happened in 1911, 
uh, and the process, what Lusun wants to portray is very frustrating. I uh, mean, who are, who are the person who is interviewing or who is, you know, capturing IQ and their mentality and the process that is more important and very fascinating. Uh, it is as if what is going to happen in cultural revolution, it is a shadow of that. Okay, how people will be caught and he doesn't know okay, what is his, at the last moment he doesn't know okay, why, what, what, what will happen to him, whether he is, he is going to be hanged or for what reason, he doesn't know. So it is a kind of, you know, okay, what is going to happen in Mao cultural revolution, it is a uh, you can say okay, it is a premonition of that. What, how you will react to it? Okay. Um, th uh, thank you, Raman. Uh, I mean, I I would beg to disagree with when you draw comparisons or parallels between 1911 revolution or as uh, it is depicted in the Akyu story with the cultural revolution uh, under, under Mao in the 60s and 70s. But uh, coming to the uh, 1911 revolution and its reflection or uh, uh, depiction in the true story of Akyu, in fact, as Sebastian also pointed out, and there is enough debate and literature available in China also, and Rawat also had mentioned that uh, he strongly feels that it is very kind of autobiographical uh, narrative. I mean, keeping all these things in mind, I think if you look at the true story of RQ, and if you look at 1911 revolution's failure, I mean, it, it perhaps cannot be denied that Lushun was extremely frustrated one, because Lushun had great expectations from the 1911 revolution. And second, as the 1911 revolution withered away, even before it was born, that added to Lushun's frustration because the very fight which Lushun was doing through his writings against the decadent feudal values or traditional values to some extent, Lushun's observation was that these values and the power of these values in Chinese sorry society. To, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I am just, if you concentrate the text, forget about Lushun, forget about everything. Yeah, no, I'm what is happening I'm, I'm, inside the text, you know, forget yeah. about historically, no in, historically okay. uh, interpretation. I am just textually, if you say. Okay. What, is, what is going to a character and how it is going to happen means how he perceives, how he perceives the world, what is going around him and, and the, who was the person who are in power, how they have captured, you know, the power. So all these things, the process itself, how they have captured the power and how they are going to decide someone's destiny, you know. So all this thing is very, very frustrating, very, very... Uh, so forget about historical circumstances, just... Concentrate on the text IQ. Okay. Huh. So, so, so just to give one line uh, sum up uh, on the basis of the text. Yeah. That, that even the uh, the um, IQ being sacrificed for the revolution, even if you look at that, that shows on the one hand the shallowness and the hollow revolution which was 1911 revolution and how it has actually worsened the everyday life of common Chinese people. And I think RQ was the best manifestation of that. So, I, I mean, uh, that is the frustration Lushun is talking about. Huh. I disagree with this because, you know, uh, he doesn't talk about 1911 or anything in the text. Okay. So what is happening in that, any, that, any, any cultural, any, any this kind of, you know, revolution so-called? Uh, that is, it is being depicted that is why, in the text. Uh, that, that it, it is, is basically how, uh, means universally, you know, wherever it is happening, some people who were just jumped the fence, you know, at the right moment and captured the power. And there is no ideology, nothing. And simple it is exertion of power. 
and nothing else. Uh, these people who are deciding RQ destiny, they don't have, they doesn't, they don't have anything ideologically. Uh, the way they behaving, uh, so it is all. I think it is, it is not, is stuck to any particular moment of history. Rather, it is stuck to the very uh, consciousness of human being. I take it in this way. Okay. I think there are uh, people who are saying that let us not have a uh, one-to-one -one dialogue between two people yeah, yeah, and let us yeah, yeah, yeah. let us open it to wider discussion. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Okay, okay. Sure, so uh, no, no, uh, we will continue our dialogue outside this. But let us yeah, have yeah. more questions. Let us have yeah, yeah, yeah. More, more questions. Yes. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, yes, Hemant, uh, may I uh, come in with a with a comment and a question? My Please. Please My do. comment is that uh, I should apologize that I was not present throughout this session. You know, the usual preoccupation with all kinds of silly things that go on. Um, so I don't know if uh, I did attend about an hour plus of the session. Um, I don't know if anyone raised with clarity or gave a detailed exposition on an Indian perspective of Lucian and uh, of the RQ uh, story. What I'm particularly interested in knowing is first, did the historical Lucian have any uh, thoughts about India? Did he write about India? Did he comment about India? That's point one. Point two, uh, has anyone in India analyzed Lucian in terms of uh, his ideas and how they uh, might relate to India. And point number three is, um, is there any lesson or message that the RQ story offers for us in India? Does it shed any light on um, India's actions and even possibly on India-China relationships. Although I, I'm sure uh, Lucian uh, may not have thought very much about that or reflected on that. These are my simple questions from a person who sadly uh, wasted his uh, years of China study uh, by not uh, reading Lucian <laughs> when he could have uh, in the original. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Rana, uh, uh, for your uh, <coughs> more than one questions, basically uh, emphasizing on whether uh, in India we have uh, our own Indian understanding of Lushun on one hand, and on the other hand, if Lushun uh, in his uh, essays or writings or um, stories had anything to say on India or com uh, how he looked at India, etc. So, uh, I mean, I, I think Rawat is more qualified to perhaps first answer this question because he, he had presented a paper today, which was on uh, how he is perceived by the Hindi uh, writers. Uh, but very quickly, I'll just say that one, because of the uh, uh, handicap of non-availability of the much of the voluminous writings of Lushun, not just short stories, but also essays and other things, were not available to Indian readers, uh, especially uh, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s onwards, what, st what started becoming available to us was also in English translations uh, on a very limited collection of uh, which was published by Foreign Languages Press in the 1950s in Beijing. Uh, in that, and there have been, as I mentioned earlier also, there have been uh, instances of uh, uh, several Indian uh, cultural thinkers, writers, uh, 
from various parts of India and from various languages of India who have read uh, in English uh, Lushun's some translations and then uh, reacted to that. And at the same time, uh, National School of Drama, for example, uh, has had two adaptations of uh, RQ. Uh, in fact, uh, I had invited uh, one faculty from the National School of Drama to participate today, but he had to ex excuse himself because, in fact, he was staging an adaptation today in the National School of Drama. And, and the first, first adaptation of RQ, uh, which had been put up by the National School of Drama, uh, the name of the RQ in the Hindi adaptation was Badlu. Badlu was the character uh, who, who was uh, adapted on the RQ character. So, uh, so there, there is enough debate and literature uh, on RQ in particular. Perhaps more than Lushun, it is RQ which is uh, discussed more, uh, partly by the, as Rawat also had mentioned, uh, by the uh, um, I mean, in the communist Indian communist literature and in and and the um, um, communist uh, cultural thinkers and activist uh, theater activists who were the first ones to adapt uh, Lushun and Akyu in the Indian uh, languages, etc. So I, uh, I I think with that brief uh, uh, inputs. I can ask Rawat to perhaps say a little bit more if he if he wants to on this uh, question. But yes, it is true that Lushun has not been uh, studied systematically. Uh, one because of the lack of uh, original literature uh, accessible to the Indian cultural thinkers and literary uh, figures, but there have been. For example, I remember in ICS uh, 2012 International Conference on 130th birth anniversary of Lushun, we had invited uh, Professor Namwar Singh, who is the who's considered as the perhaps the tallest figure in the Hindi in particular, but modern Indian literary theory and criticism. And he had also said that uh, he had studied Lushun in the 50s and 60s. And on the question of Lushun's many works being withdrawn from China now, so he had said that, uh, let us always remember that a writer becomes great only when that writer continues to be relevant in his or her own country, not as much outside that country. So, uh, and we have many such instances, but not a very systematic, uh, as you pointed out, uh, study, uh, which can be called an Indian perspective on Lushun or Lushun's works, etc. So with this, I will request uh, the, my colleague Rawat to say uh, if he has anything to say on this. Rawat? Ra Rawat, are you there? Okay, carry on. Okay. okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Am I audible? Yes. But I yes, am yes. uh, I'm not very sure the question is, is it from Ambassador Rana or whom this thing, a question? Yes, the question is from Ambassador Rana, yeah. Okay, okay. So, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, anyway, yes, I think uh, uh, I'm not, I cannot answer this question to, uh, in a very clear cut way, but I myself feel, yes, there is an Indian view of Lusu. But who are these Indians? That is the question. Academics, teaching in the universities, writing literary criticism, that is one. Second, political parties as a whole, progressive kind of thing. So first is academic to me. Second is that progressive uh, uh, circle of uh, people in India. And uh, third, I limited myself to poets. Poets. And especially in the morning session, I was speaking on my, in fact, my paper was on 
uh, the image of Lusun in the eyes of Indian writer. And here I have picked up, in fact, I can't dare to uh, say anything about these three poets. That is first Nagarjun, second Sarvedasatayal Saksena, and third Gajanan Madhav Muktipur. All these three is eminent, eminent, very famous uh, poet. I think they have their, uh, uh, they, 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 they have said, the, yes, we have to learn uh, something from Lusun, especially Muktivod, Gajanan Madhav Muktivod, who, who, who is very complex poet, uh, clearly uh, saying that. And I will again say that he has said that uh, uh, somewhere, uh, uh, yeah, uh, somewhere uh, I just find that. Oh, yes, Mr. Rawat, uh, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, yeah. My apologies that I missed your talk. Yeah. Uh, I, I really did miss that. And I really don't want you to repeat the things okay. you have already said. I'm not repeating. I think there are others who have questions, and I think maybe uh, the chair should move on to another questioner. But I greatly appreciate all that you have said. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Okay, okay, and Mr. Rana, thank you so much, and Ravaji, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, we have any more questions now? I have. I have. Saurabh Kumar, I think, has a comment. Ravaji, let's take some more questions and then we can reply. I have one question. Can I? Okay. Yeah. 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 Let Let Ambassador Saurabh Kumar first ask. Okay. Okay. Question. Sorry. 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 Please. Yes, Ambassador Saurabh Kumar, please unmute yourself. You can't unmute? Okay. Okay, um, there's, there's some problem there. Okay, uh, Rawat, can you ask your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, may I may I ask right now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, am I audible too? Yeah, yes. Yes. Okay. My question is from uh, uh, my question, not in fact question, but my curiosity, and I want to avail this opportunity to clarify myself. And this is to Professor uh, Alex Zirodino from Russia. Uh, I have three curiosities, Professor uh, Rodino that uh, if I followed your uh, this thing uh, clearly, you have mentioned that in Russia, these six writers were uh, like Lusun, Laosa, Changkheni, Mautun, Pachin, and Kuamoro. They were the, how they were listed in Russia as such in terms of canon, am I right? So I, I really wonder that Laosa second, yes, I can understand that, but Pachin coming to fifth, that is my question, because in 20s and 30s in China, Mautun and Pachin was really crazed for young people. This is one curiosity of mine. Second, uh, yeah, second is, uh, uh, second is, uh, yes, my second uh, related to this is, uh, uh, you have uh, 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 mentioned this. Uh, 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 yes, let me let me just uh, yeah yeah. This, these five translation, five translation by by uh, by Palivo, uh, Yeah, all these translation by five Russian uh, translator. And uh, there you have said, and I want to know the your opinion about is it possible to uh, really uh, remove. Uh, uh, introductory, introductory ch chapters or remove some part. Though I know reading in some translation, I did also compare. Yes, sometimes they have just not bothered and uh, in original uh, is something and in translation it is not there. So could you say something this uh, on the technique of translation and my first, uh, first question. And second I had in mind, but I had forgotten somewhere, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. So actually, as for the rating you saw, it's a rating of uh, uh, judging on the number of translations. 
and uh, it achieves these numbers in 50s and 60s, not in 30s. And uh, mm. in 50s, in 50s, uh, Soviet publishers uh, um, they first uh, published and translated uh, the works of those uh, writers which have a high position. Uh, in uh, communist China at that time. So yes, it's true that in the 30s, uh, Badzin one was uh, one of the most readed writers um, uh, but uh, in, in China. But if we speak about translation, it already had in 50s. Thus it's a sort of a distorted picture uh, of Chinese literary arena. But I think that in that rating, the most peculiar scene is not even about Badzin, but about the third place of Zhang Tianyi, because Lu Xun, Lao She, and number three is Zhang Tianyi. Zhang Yi, by far, is not such important writer as Badzin, Mao Dun, or Gamajo, and he has surpassed them to be number three. Why? It's that's a rather interesting story because he was not only a proletariat writer and wrote serious literature, but he was also a children's, he also wrote literature. And his stories for children were extremely popular in the Soviet Union. So that's a very special case. Uh, yeah, so that's my answer to that question. And the second about uh, all this, uh, how chapters were cut, yes, but I would say it's, it's a, not a normal situation. And I would say that in our Russian translation tradition, we usually stick to the original and we do not easily cut parts of the text. But here we have such two examples. And the first example was that just translator was not uh, good in Chinese and he just couldn't understand what is going on there. That's why he decided that if it's so complicated to understand for him, it will be even more complicated for the reader. That's the first case, 1929. And in 1955, it was probably uh, the necessity to cut the number of letters. The text was too big. So either it will be included or it will not be included. And uh, the decision by the translator was not to select another text by Lusun, but to have the true story, but in cut version. Yeah, it was not a good decision, I agree. Yeah, that's Thank all Thank you. Answer. Thank you. Thank you, Alexei. Uh, we, can, we can now turn to Ambassador Saurabh Kumar for his question. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Adlaka and all the presenters. It's a very enjoyable, instructive seminar. I, I, I really uh, enjoyed it very much. And uh, the last session, especially, as I said, I like it, but all the first one, also the poetry, spoke, the poetry. And just for curiosity, and my question is different. You may have seen in the chat. Is there a translation in any Indian language from the Chinese original, Aki? Not from English? Uh, I'm afraid no. I thought so. And I think that is amongst the projects we have, I think an exchange program now may be defunct, a large scale translation program, intergovernmental, uh, this should be. Because Heyman, what you mentioned, and my question is much the same on uh, Dr. Rana's lines, mm -hmm. the Indian perspective on this. Thing. And uh, before I forget, what you mentioned in your introductory remarks about the treatment being meted out, 2004-05, uh, disappearing from the textbooks, you see, to my mind, this is a question, this is only to be expected, the whole controversy about this one, because this is, a, this is a political conflict unplayed. The Communist Party, I'm mentioning an observation, you are all academicians, this needs, they have never resolved, they hijacked power. The question of the correct revolution was never resolved in debate. And in political process, debate partly, yes, we do for you, but not in process. So the treatment, why the insecurity about this? 
it goes right to the heart of the legitimacy and justification of the present revolution said and said and each one claiming the legacy of aki of mission is the thing so so it's not so bad but for that reason makes it all the more so much important for us to understand the key and to say and to to know the indian perspective and i just like to make a comment on ambas purana's question you see the other way round dusun's approach towards india i have read he he was a very well read man he traveled and studied medicine before that you know darwin and so on he was not very impressed by the indian literature of the day and um, uh, it is somewhat like the treatment meted out to pego at that time for not being uh, not india as such we should not conflate india there was no this is not against india the ancient indian literature he had praised he had value for but not the contemporary literature because at that time the indian image like in case of pego was thoroughly a beaten country beaten society a beaten psyche by Good. So, uh, uh, in the thing, but there again, there is a field day for scholars or younger scholars because in China there have been re-evaluation, as in case of this one, the whole has been brought out. So, in particular, on uh, the relevant this this uh, rejection by Lu Xun of India, which is pretty categorical, if I remember right, it is prior to Tagore's visit. Also, I remember that. Was later on by another author, Howran, who was actually a peasant, yeah. like Premchand. And I'm actually on that. By the way, I'm struck that nobody mentioned Premchand uh, in the context except uh, Professor Rawat uh, passing. But Premchand, uh, Howran called Lucian uh, called Premchand the Indian Lucian. Yes. and and uh, that in that he is in some ways and so on but the treatment of dusun being center of politics in china unlike prem chan who is considered just a writer so there is there is a lot of uh, rich comparison comparative study material here to my mind thank you but thank you all again thank you thank you ambassador saurabh uh, i mean you've raised questions which one can go on debating for the whole day or maybe days together and since we have now run out of time so i would not even initiate to reply to some of the points you've raised but suffice it to say that uh, i mean tagore controversy of course uh, what we what we know little about is that one tagore was so unfamiliar or tagore's works were so unfamiliar to most chinese at that time because there was no translation available of tagore's works and only gitanjali had been translated into japanese and that is how they came to know about uh, gitanjali and the reason why tagore and lushun uh, or lushun never made an attempt to meet tagore during the two visits which tagore paid to china and but the but the curious thing is that every time tagore was in china and giving lectures even in uh, peiching once lushun was there and lushun sent his own disciples to go and listen to tagore and then come back and report to lushun what did tagore say and and one of the reasons why they did not meet one of the reasons why they did not meet was because the the hosts of tagore in china they were at logger heads with the progressive and left and radical intellectuals mm -hmm. so uh, that was also another for example i mentioned uh, roland roman roland's uh, 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 note uh, on aq and actually uh, it was sent to uh, uh, creative society in china to be passed on to lushun and that creative society did, never passed on roland's note to lushun again because of the internal uh, contradictions and internal conflicts and all that but on tagore and lushun i i personally uh, uh, feel very happy when people ask me such questions to reply that although when they were alive they never met each other 
even when Tagore visited China twice, once in Shanghai and once in Beijing, Rushun was there, but they never met each other. But look at the irony now. There is a Rushun bust sitting in Calcutta, right in the center of Calcutta, near the Tagore University. And Tagore's bust is sitting both in uh, Beijing and Shanghai, not far from where Lushun used to live. So that, that's, that's, that, that's very interesting. So on that note, if, uh, if you uh, give me the permission to announce the uh, end of today's event, uh, let me thank all the participants, especially the speakers, and uh, because, as I mentioned earlier, because of the COVID times and also because of today being a working day, and since many of our participants and speakers are from the universities or research institutions or academic institutions, they all have commitments. So that was one reason why we decided not to have the usual format of a conference of inaugural lecture, keynote address, etc., etc. And we decided that since people cannot sit through the whole day, so we'll just have sessions and then discussions, and that's it. So uh, once again, I thank my colleagues in ICS, especially the younger colleagues who helped us put up this event together, and uh, Director ICS, and all other participants for their questions, and for the speakers for bringing to us wonderful perspectives and uh, discussions on Lushun and Akyu. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you. Bye-bye.